We're going to be in the book of Proverbs chapter 15, if you want to find that uh, in your Bibles today. We're going to be hopping around a little bit, as you can see there in your bulletin, but mostly camping out there in Proverbs 15. Let me ask you a question. This is not a trick question. Um, it's, it's just the question that it is, all right? So you guys, by show of hands or by show of like button, if you're out there uh, on social media, by show of hands or like button, how many of you know somebody who has done something foolish in their life? <laughs> okay, good. Every hand went up. That's, that's good. Every, it looks like everybody knows somebody that's done something foolish. Uh, let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever done something foolish in your life? Okay, most every hand went up. A couple of y'all didn't raise your hands on that one. Um, if you had somebody sitting next to you who didn't raise their hand, I want you to turn to them and look at them, and I want you to say, what's wrong with you? You fool. You're lying in church. <laughs> not good to lie in church. It's not a good thing. We've all done something foolish, haven't we? all have something in our past that we wish we wouldn't have done, took the wrong path, made the wrong choice, just had a momentary lapse in judgment. Have you ever had that time when you, you look back like five years later, 10 years later, or sometimes five minutes later, and you go, what, what was I thinking? Amen. Have any of y'all, are y'all, any of y'all old enough to have had that, that moment in your life where you look back and go, what was I doing? What was going through my mind? Why, why did I even do that? Because you, you realize that you made a foolish decision. In Proverbs 15, we find this principle. We find what was going on in your mind, more than likely. It's what I call the dangers of a happy heart. The dangers of a happy heart. You didn't hear me wrong. The danger of a happy heart. Some of you are thinking, well, what, what's wrong with making my heart happy? What's wrong with bringing happiness to my heart, why would that be dangerous? Well, if you stick with me for the next few minutes, I think you're going to see that much of the foolishness in your life and much of the foolishness in the lives of people around you, in the world and the culture that surrounds you, comes from the same place, comes from the, the root or the genesis of almost all of it is the pursuit of making your heart happy. Making your heart happy. That's the danger of a happy heart. Proverbs 15, 21 says this, Foolishness brings joy, happiness, to the one without sense, but a person with understanding walks a what? Straight path. This verse comes in a long list of comparisons and contradictions. I don't want us to go back. We're not going to talk about each and every one of them, but I want you to see the context. I want you to hear the truth behind this verse, because some of you are probably going, I don't know if this is true or not. Well, let's back up and let, let's just go to verse 16, for example. We could go back further, but just for some context, I just picked 16 as a good place to start. Let's back up, and I want to read through these verses one by one, and I want you to just examine them, see if you think they're true or not, okay? Okay. And the way we're going to do this is like we always do. If you're on the internet, hit the like button. If you're here in the room, say amen, okay? If you think these are true, if you think these Proverbs line up and are truth, then just say amen or hit the like button. Verse 16, better a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with turmoil. Amen. amen. Okay, it's pretty good amen. Verse 17, Better a meal of vegetables, that's not starting good. We're talking about a plate of broccoli, y'all. Okay? A meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened ox where there is hatred. Amen. It's true. It's, it's good. It's right. 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but one slow to anger claims, calms strife. Amen. We've all probably seen that one at work. A slacker's way is like a thorny hedge, but the path of the upright is a highway. It's a good word. Verse 20, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Oh, got some mamas in the room. Amen in that one this morning. 
Verse 21, our text, foolishness brings joy to one without sense, but a person with understanding walks a straight path. Amen. 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 Y'all still aren't too sure about that one. Okay, that's fine. We're going to dive into that one. But verse 22, plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Amen. Amen. It's true. See, I wanted to do that because I want you to understand that our text is true as well. And I want you to see in this long list of comparisons and contradictions that the, the writer here is putting forth, that there's a right path and a wrong path that you can choose. In each of these scenarios or situations, there's a good path and a bad path, a right path and a wrong path. And none of them are hidden paths. None of them are secret paths. None of them are hard paths to see or hard paths to find or difficult paths to understand. None of them are paths that you have to be a theologian to be able to comprehend. If we're all honest, though, we've all at one time or another chosen the wrong paths that are mentioned in this text. And why is that? Why do we take the wrong path? Why do we make the wrong decision? Why do we do the wrong thing so many times in life? Well, I would submit to you today, the primary reason is what we see in our verse for today. The primary reason is we do it to make our little hearts happy. Foolishness brings joy to one without sense, but a person with understanding walks a straight path. From that passage right there, we're going to see that what makes our heart happy might not be what makes God happy. What makes our heart happy might not make God's heart happy. There's a difference between pursuing happiness and pursuing holiness. If you pursue holiness, you will ultimately end up happy, but if you pursue happiness, you don't ultimately end up holy. It doesn't work in reverse. What makes our heart happy may not be the best path for us because foolishness brings joy to one without sense. The big takeaway for today is this. It's right at the top of your bulletin if you're making notes. It's simply this. God's priorities are better than a fool's preferences. God's priorities are always better than a fool's preferences. If you make life about the happiness of your heart and your own personal preferences, then I promise you, you will walk a fool's path in life. To avoid being that person, to avoid the fool's path, we have to do three things when it comes to our hearts. And I'm going to warn you right here at the onset, they're not easy things. They're difficult things. In fact, they're so hard, I would dare to venture most of you will not do them. But this is the only way you're going to get control of the happy heart syndrome that has infected us all. The first one is this, you have to find the right things. You have to find the right things. If you're being honest with yourself, no raising hands, no saying amen, no, no, no even blinking your eyes twice, okay? I don't want any indications from you. But if you're just being honest today, honest with yourself and honest with the Lord, if it's just you and God in the room right now, and in a moment of just pure, raw honesty... How would, you, how would you answer this question? Do you wake up every morning thinking about making your heart happy, or do you wake up every morning thinking about making God's heart happy? I think if we're honest, and if we really have time to consider that question, I mean, we want to just say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm about making God's heart happy. But if we're really honest, and if we evaluate our lives I think the majority of us, perhaps 100% of us, would have to say that we wake up on a happiness quest every morning, not a holiness quest. We wake up on a happiness quest, not a truth quest. We're on a happiness quest in life. Every day when we woke up, we want to be happy. And you want to know why you want to be happy? Because it feels good to be happy, doesn't it? And because it feels so good to be happy, we get addicted to being happy. We're not addicted to the happiness of others. We're not addicted to the happiness or the holiness of God, but we are addicted to the happiness of our little hearts and our life. 
You see, the problem is we don't wake up on a truth quest or a holiness quest. We wake up on a happiness quest every day. And I know I'm meddling here, and, and I know some of y'all are going to get mad at me about this one. But that's okay, because it's a good illustration for our point. Most of y'all wake up, many of y'all wake up every morning, and you go right to the same place, the coffee pot. Hey, 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 I'm getting some hey, hey, stop it right there. Y'all know we make gallons and gallons and gallons of coffee here at this church. Because y'all like coffee. And you get up and you go to that coffee pot. You want to know why you go to that coffee pot? Because coffee makes you what? Happy. (laughs) And you know what? It makes other people happy too. Because if some of y'all stopped drinking coffee, other people in your life would say, you start drinking coffee again. Because you turn into a monster when you're not on your coffee. They're going to want you drinking your coffee. People don't smoke cigarettes because it's healthy. They smoke cigarettes because it makes them happy. We don't drink alcohol because it quenches our thirst. We drink it because it makes us happy. You didn't rack up all those credit card bills and max those credit cards out again because you thought it was wise. You did it because whatever you were buying made your little heart happy. People don't marry an unbeliever or a lukewarm Christian because they're mission-minded. No. They married that person because there was something about them that made them in that moment happy. You didn't move in with your boyfriend or your girlfriend because you had to. I know that's what you told your mom and dad. I know that's what you told your preacher. We had to do it. They forced us to. Circumstances. No, you didn't have to. You did it because it made you happy. You didn't spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on your cosmetic surgery because it was a necessity. You did it Because it made you happy, or it made him happy. But happiness was the motivation. You probably didn't buy your last new vehicle because you wore the last one before it out. No, you bought it because it made you happy. At least for a minute. You see, from minute to minute and moment to moment, from the time you wake up every morning... You and I are on a happiness quest. We're trying to figure out what is going to make our little hearts happy. And so we pursue whatever it is that's going to make our heart happy. And honestly, for most of you, that doesn't sound that bad because you like happy. And you want your heart to be happy. It doesn't sound that bad until you realize that making your little heart happy is what is making you go down the wrong paths in life. And it's what's making you wake up years, weeks, months, decades later and go, what was I thinking? Well, you were thinking about your happiness. Jeremiah 17, 9 outlines the root of the problem. The heart is more deceitful than anything else. An in, and incurable, who can understand it? Your heart is deceitful. It's incurable. In other words, there's not a magic prayer, a magic pill that's going to fix it. There, there, there's nothing you can do to, to cure your heart from this quest of happiness. Your desire to be happy... And to make your little heart happy is something that's never going to go away. You've got to battle it every single day. It's always going to be there. You can call it your flesh. You can call it your heart. Call it whatever you want. But you're going to have to fight it. You're going to always have to examine the motives and the intentions of your heart. And you're going to have to examine those against the purity and the truth of God's word and his holiness. You see, your heart wants whatever is going to make it happy Right now, it's on a happiness quest from the moment you wake up. But God wants you to have what's going to make you happy-est. 
And making you happiest may not happen with your happiness today. That might mean you don't get to happiest till tomorrow or a year from now or maybe a decade from now. It may mean you have to work to get to happiest and what is best. It may mean you can't be happy today or right now because God has something better for you in the future. James talks about the danger of our internal desires in his discussion about trials and temptations. And I want you to listen to what he says about the danger of our desires, the desires of our hearts. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, he says, No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. This is the trouble with following the desires of your heart. The happiness of your heart. Making that a priority in your life. See, James is saying that our trials and temptations come not from God, but from our own desires. Because we want to be happy. And we want to be happy right now. This is why people watch pornography instead of working on their marriage. Because one will make them happy now, and the other is going to take time and work and effort. It'll bring them a lot more happiness for the rest of their life if they would work on their marriage. But no, they want to be happy right now, so they click and they watch. This is why people won't break up with their boyfriend or their girlfriend that they know is an atheist or a non-believer or an agnostic or a lukewarm Christian who just knows all the answers but is not following the Lord. They won't break up with that man or that woman or that boy or that girl because they want to be happy right now. And they got a birthday in two weeks. Christmas is right around the corner. Valentine's Day comes right after that. All their friends have boyfriends and girlfriends. They don't want to be left out. They want to be happy today. Even though pursuing that happiness right now is going to mean they're not going to be happy later. You see, we have to totally be retrained and transformed in the way we think. If we have any hope of walking and staying on the right path in life. We have to wake up every day looking for God's truth, not our happiness. And that's why I told you at the very beginning that God's priorities are always better than a fool's preferences. See, making your heart happy is not the most important thing in life unless you're foolish. Foolishness brings joy to one without sense, but a person with understanding walks a straight path. As believers, we should wake up every day seeking the kingdom of God and the things of God. Not in a general way, not not in just, okay, I'm a believer and I'm about God's kingdom. No, I'm talking about in a very specific, intentional way that we are running hard and pursuing Jesus. Jesus calls us to do that. And there's a promise attached to his command and his calling to be this way and to have this kind of a mindset. And I want you to see it. I want you to notice it. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, if you want to turn over there. And and, And this is Jesus talking And there's a very specific command here, a very specific calling for your life and for my life, and then a very specific promise that comes at the end of it. And spoiler alert, the promise is not that you're going to be happy. What did Jesus say? It's a familiar text, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he says, and all these things will be provided for you. You see, the promise is not that your heart will be happy. The promise is is that God will be your provision. See, a fool will pick happiness in the moment. They'll pick the happiness of their heart. They'll pick the happiness that comes with their selfishness. But a wise person will pick the right path, which is the eternal provision of Christ, his cross, and him crucified. The eternal provision of God making a way. The eternal provision of God never leaving them. They will say, you know what? I will forgo happiness and I will accept God's provision as enough. 
And that will change your perspective and it will change your life. We've got to seek God's truth instead of our own personal happiness. There's a second thing we have to do equally as hard. And that is, after we find the right path or the right thing, we've got to follow it. We've got to follow the right things. Look at the second part of our verse for today. After we see that the foolish person is seeking joy and happiness, the text says that the person with understanding or the wise person does something else. Here's the contradiction or the comparison. Foolishness brings joy to one without sense, but a person with understanding walks a straight path. They walk. They don't just sit back and hold on to it. They don't just sit back and see what's going to happen. They don't just sit back and say, well, I I found the right path and that's good enough. No, it says they walk on it. They do something with the truth that they found. They do something with the holiness they're pursuing. They do something with the plan that God has marked out for them. They walk on it. They do something with it. They don't just find it. They walk on it. See, it's one thing to find the right path by pursuing God's priorities and forsaking your happiness, but it's a whole other thing to then stay on it and walk on it with the Lord. It's harder. And it's harder than you might think. Do you know why? Because your heart's going to wake up again tomorrow and you're going to have to retrain it all over again because tomorrow when you wake up, it's going to want to be happy again. And as we discovered a minute ago, it's incurable. And fighting against the happiness of your heart is very, very hard. I've mentioned multiple times through this series um, Andy Stanley's book, The Principle of the Path. It's a book all my children have to read when they become teenagers. It's a book I would encourage all of you to read because some of you are still acting like teenagers. Did I just say that? (laughs) No. (laughs) Preach it. It is a good book. It's a book that inspired this whole sermon series, and a lot of this is, is coming out of Andy's book and his work on it, and I would encourage you to take a copy of it. But I want to read to you a quote that he said because he just nails it. He says, when we stand at the crossroads between prudent and happy, we lie to ourselves. We quickly turn into dishonest salespeople. We begin selling ourselves on what we want to do rather than on what we ought to to do. We then listen to ourselves until we believe our own lies. And then we opt for happiness. We listen to our hearts and then we assign our heads the responsibility of building a case to support our decision and our heart's quest for happiness. In other words, we can set out to find the right path and we can even find it But then when we get to that crossroads and we see God's truth, we can still talk ourselves out of it pretty easy because we still at the end want to be happy. We can find it and still talk ourselves out of it. The writer of Proverbs says the same thing in a much more blunt and shocking way in Proverbs 26, 11 and 12. He says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. Do you see a person who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In other words, the problem is is not that you can't find the path. The problem is that you find it, but you still go back to the wrong one. You find the truth, but you still reject the truth. You know what to do, but you still don't do it because you talk yourself out of it. You find the path, but you don't do anything with it And you never walk on it. Because, see, that's the thing. Once you find the right path, then you have to walk on it and stay on it. I'll give you some examples. You can make a budget. But if you're scrolling through Amazon and you find something that you didn't budget for and your heart says, that will make me happy, and you buy it, and it's not in your budget, guess what? Your budget's not going to (laughs) work. And it's all out the window. Because you didn't stay on the path that you had set out. Even though you justified in your mind, you just had to have it, right? 
You can say you're going to go to church every single week and God's going to be a priority and you're taking your family and all that's going to be good. And I know I'm preaching in the choir. You're all the ones that showed up today. But I'm telling you, if you don't protect Sunday morning, other stuff will crowd in on Sunday morning. Other stuff will creep in on Sunday morning. And before you know it, you're going to wake up one day and go, man, I haven't been to church in weeks or months or years. You see, there always comes a time when no matter what it is, you have to put your preferences aside to make room for God's priorities in your life. And every time that happens, whatever that is, it's going to rub up against your short-term momentary happiness, and you're going to be very tempted to pick, pick happiness. And if you're not really fully convinced and convicted about the reality that God's priorities are better than a fool's preferences, then you will pick happiness every time. And you'll follow the desires of your heart, which is going to lead you to happiness, to walk the path of a fool instead of the path that God has marked out for you. Church, we're not the only ones to struggle with this. And by the way, I struggle with this as much as y'all do. There's nothing I'm preaching to you today that God hadn't been preaching to me for weeks. But we see this struggle in the New Testament. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the disciples of Jesus. We see it in the early church. I'll give you just one example for the sake of time. Paul told the Ephesians this in Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. He said, pay careful attention then to how you walk, the path you're on, what you're doing with your life. He says, not as unwise people, but as wise people, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Watch your path, he's saying Make sure you're on the right one and walk on it. And then listen to verse 17. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which we, leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. He's talking to the church. He says, don't get drunk. Don't practice reckless living. Be filled by the Spirit instead. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Well, getting drunk sounds more fun. Seems like that'll make me more happy, though. Then he goes on, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of your Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds kind of dull and boring compared to getting drunk and living recklessly. Submitting to one another, he says next. In the fear of Christ. And he goes on. You see, there's a problem here in this church, just like there was in the Corinthian church and the letter to the Galatians, and we, we could read about all of them. There's really a problem with all of them because this is a heart issue that doesn't just affect us. It's always affected us. They woke up on a happiness quest just like you do. And Paul says, hey, the truth and holiness have to stand above your preferences. And it's going to rub up against your happiness here in the short term, but it's better for you and everyone else if you pursue truth and holiness instead of happiness. Once again, we see how important it is to walk the right path. We can't just stand on it. We can't just look at it. We can't just say we know where it is. We've got to walk on it. Paul says to these guys, don't do what's making you happy. Do what is wise. Do what is best. Walk on the right path. Do the things that are right and true and holy and pleasing to God. This is the principle of following the path of the wise that the early church needed to hear just like you and I do today. The reality is we all need to see it, hear it, and work on it because it affects all of us. I want to close with this last one and let me just tell you, if you didn't like the first two, you're really not going to like this one. Um, this is the hardest of all of them. And, and this is the one, this is, the, this is really the reason why I told you at the beginning that most of you aren't going to do this. In fact, this one right here is the reason 99% or better of you will leave here and not do anything with what we're talking about. Number three, you have to fess up to the right thing. You got to fess up. And this is really the key to it all. We, we might call it repentance. Fessing up means simply that we are honest with ourselves and we're honest with God. Throughout today's message, we've been 
talking about the importance of being honest with ourselves and honest with God. Church, we can't find and follow the right path if we won't fess up and be honest with God. We've got to stop making excuses. We've got to stop trying to justify our actions. We've got to stop trying to pretend that our quest for happiness is somehow the same thing as a quest for holiness because it's not. We just need to fess up and say, you know what, God, we've been wrong. This isn't right, and I'm going to do better. And listen, I know that's hard to do. I know it's really, really hard to fess up to these things in life. It's probably terrifying to most of you, and it's why most people won't do it. Let me show you how hard this is. It means that we have to say things like, the real reason I filed for divorce is... The, the real reason I maxed out my credit cards again is. The real reason I watch pornography is. The real reason I drink too much is. The real reason I stop going to church is. The real reason I'm living with my boyfriend or my girlfriend is. The real reason I won't make a commitment and put a ring on her finger is. The real reason I lie about my family and I make excuses for them all the time is. See, it's real hard to be honest about those things, isn't it? Because you've made excuses your whole life. You've invested years, perhaps even decades, into those excuses and justifying your path and the paths other people around you continually take and you continually choose And the only reason you can make those paths look halfway decent is because you figured out ways to justify them that make sense to everybody else who's justifying their own poor decisions going down poor paths. I remember something that happened in my house a while back, a couple years ago, that I think illustrates really how we can deceive ourselves so easily. I was sitting um, at the head of our dining room table And our house has an open floor plan. So from the dining room, you can see the living room and the kitchen and everything. And my four children, I have four kids, for those of you who don't know, they were all sitting in the living room on the couch. We have one of those big couches that makes kind of like a U. And everybody was kind of sitting in there. And they were watching TV, horsing around, doing, I don't remember what they were doing, but they were all in there. And I was just watching them, just kind of sitting there. And one of my kids for some reason I can't recall right now, just slapped one of the other kids on the back of the head. And and I don't even know why they did it. I'm not going to tell you who it was because I don't want to embarrass them. They go to church here. It's tough being a preacher's kid, (laughs) you know. So I don't want to tell you which one it was. But one of them did that. They just, they hit one of the other kids on the back of the head. And as soon as that happened, and I saw it, I was watching them. I saw it happen. As soon as it happened, the kid who got hit, I mean, went into a full-on cry of death (laughs) as if their head had just been partially severed from their shoulders. And the child who hit the other kid immediately yelled, like almost simultaneously, I didn't do it. (laughs) Y'all are laughing because you've had this conversation in your house, I bet. And the screaming kid comes running over to me, Dad, 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 Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. They hit me. It hurts so bad. Do I have blood coming out my ears? (laughs) And the other kid at the same time is screaming, I didn't do anything. I didn't do it. And they're both very sincere in their conviction. One thinks they are about to die. They bet you better get them to the hospital. The other thinks they legitimately didn't do anything. They've both convinced themselves of a lie. So at this point, I call the little terrorist over. (laughs) And I said, I saw you do it. I watched you. And as soon as I say those words, the crying child, who's also standing there next to me, takes it up a notch because now they think dad is on their side. 
And we, you know, I probably have a concussion, dad, brain injury. I mean, they are just turning into, it's dramatic. And I say, I saw it happen. They didn't hit you that hard. No, daddy, I think I might die. The whole room is spinning. You know, they're just going on and on. See, I knew the one had done it, and I knew the other one was going to be just fine. I remember even saying, you don't even have a red mark. You're going to be all right. But they had both convinced themselves of a lie. And you want to know why they both did it? Convinced themselves of a lie? Because they were both on a happiness quest. I knew the truth because I saw it happen. I knew that one had hit the other one. I knew the one that got hit was going to be just fine because I watched it all happen. But they kept saying, I didn't do it. I'm going to die. I didn't do it. I'm going to die. And they were genuinely convinced of their lie because they both wanted to be happy. One wanted to get away with something without a punishment, which would have made them very happy. The other wanted to see the other child punished harshly for a minor offense, which would have made that child happy. Neither of them was being honest. They both had fully convinced themselves of their version of the story. And no matter how many times I said it, they didn't believe me. But you know what? They couldn't fool me because I had seen it. I knew the truth. I think that's probably kind of how God looks at us most of the time. You know, he already knows the truth. He can see into your heart. You haven't hidden anything from him. There's no secrets you can keep from God. But you know what we keep doing to God? We keep giving him excuses, justifications, presenting our case. And all the while, he's looking at us just saying, you know what, just be honest. Just be honest with yourself and be honest with me. When Paul was encouraging the Romans to guard against pride and prejudice, He also encouraged them to be honest with themselves. Romans 12, 3, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, he says, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. He says, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. He doesn't say measure yourself against your neighbor. He doesn't say measure yourself against the culture. He doesn't say measure yourself against your pastor or your spouse. He says, you measure yourself against the faith God has given you, the truth God has put before you. That's how we should measure ourselves, and we need to be honest about where we stand up on that measurement. The psalmist said it like this in Psalms 15, 1 and 2. Lord, who can dwell in your tent? Great question. Who can live on your holy mountain? Yes, tell me the answer. These are good questions. Verse 2. The one who lives blamelessly practices righteousness, and guess what? And the one who acknowledges the truth in his heart. The one who's honest with God and honest with himself. You see, we need to be quick to acknowledge the truth about God and about ourselves in all situations and in every path that we've chosen to walk down. Let me close with what John said in 1 John 1, 6 through 10. John said, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and we're not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is why I told you at the beginning, God's priorities are better than a fool's preferences. See, what John is saying here is you you can lie and you can pretend you're not a sinner, but you are, and God knows it and you know it, so why not just be honest about it? You can choose a path of untruthfulness or a path of excuses or a path of justification, but it doesn't change the fact that God has already seen it. He says just be 
honest. See, we, are, we have to find the truth, we have to follow the truth, and then we have to fess up to the truth. Instead of running after whatever trickery, toy, temptation, or temporary treasure the world is putting in front of your nose today that's going to make your little heart happy for a moment. Did you hear what John just said? We need to acknowledge we're sinners. That may be the hardest thing at all of all to do. Hardest thing for somebody to do is say, I'm a sinner and I need help. Some of you won't come to the cross, you won't come to Jesus because you won't acknowledge that you're a sinner because you're looking at your neighbor going, well, I'm pretty good. You're looking at the people in prison going, well, I'm better than them. God says, no, 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 let's be honest. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us because Romans says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I don't care who you are, how old you are, how rich you are, how white you are, how dark you are. I don't care. You're in all. For all have sinned. You're, you're, you're in all. <laughs> if we say we have no sin, if we say we're not in need of a Savior, we're just deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know who the truth is? His name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And nobody comes to the Father except through him. And then he goes on and he says, but if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. If we fess up and say, you know what, God, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved by your grace, then he is faithful to forgive. Faithful to seal us with the Holy Spirit, impart his righteousness into your life, not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it, but simply because he is faithful. And he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you will just be honest and fess up. But you got to start right there. If you're here today or can hear my voice today and have never given your life to the Lord, I pray that you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That you would give your life to the Lord at this hour and be saved. Let's pray. If you're here today and have never said yes to the gospel, never said yes to Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity to do that before we close. We're not going to ask you to walk an aisle, to raise a hand, stay after church and meet with us. We're just going to ask you to do business with God. You found the path. Now you have a choice as to whether or not you're going to follow it. And the reality is you can't follow it until you fess up. And ask God to forgive you. So if that's you, follow me in this prayer. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. I pray that you would make me new. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your peace. I thank you for sending Jesus to die for me so I could be cleansed of my sin. Thank you for your grace and love. Lord, again, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be in your house, to open your word, to feel your presence, to know that you love us and forgive us, and to know that you have a plan for our life, and to know that no matter how many times we have chosen happiness over holiness, you still love us the same. Lord, I know it's going to be hard for us to choose holiness over happiness because, well, we like happiness. It's just easy to say yes to happiness. But Father, I pray you would give us the courage to be honest this week and in the days to come to find and to follow the path that you've marked out for us. And Lord, that somehow, some way, we could wake up and wage war against that old deceitful heart of ours every single day when it says, make me happy. 
Lord, that we would have the courage to say, no, we're going to make you holy. We're going to seek what's going to make us happiest in the end, which is following God's word, not what's going to make us happy today. Lord, that we would walk the path that you have marked for us and be blessed by it. I love you, Lord. I thank you. And I pray that you bless these who love you and have come to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.